Um, so thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is John Daly, the story of a Jewish ex-Nazi. I bet you never heard, thought you would hear from a Jewish ex-Nazi, but it's actually a true story. Uh, this isn't about some fictional Hollywood story. Uh, you're going to hear a real biographical account, but more importantly, we're going to use his expertise to learn more about the radicalization process, how to bring someone out of it, and how this can happen even in a family like yours. Yes, you guys, all of you watching. Um, it's not just people who are mentally ill or abused or anything else like we commonly associate um, with that type of radicalism. It can really happen in any family. And so this is an amazing opportunity for us to learn more about that problem and how it can affect all of us. Uh, before we go to John and we hear more about his story, uh, I first wanna thank our partners who made this possible. Uh, and that includes combat anti-Semitism, the LA Israel Consulate General, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, the Canadian Security Research Group, ZOA Michigan, and Stand With Us Midwest. So we've got a lot of friends teaming up with us in order to make this possible, and we're very appreciative of that. We encourage everyone to check out their websites and see the good work that they're all involved in. Um, again, the purpose of this webinar uh, is not just to hear an absolutely fascinating biography, uh, it's to learn more about the problem of extremism and how really, and this is possibly the best case I've ever heard of, how each and every one of us can impact someone entering the radicalization process, whether we know it or not, and really save lives. Um, so, so it's a really fascinating discussion. A little bit about John. Uh, Basically, his story is one of the most incredible you'll ever hear. Uh, he was a high-ranking officer in the neo-Nazi organization, eventually becomes a candidate for the Israeli Knesset, and it's all real life. Uh, he didn't know he was Jewish, and so he was recruited into a national skinhead organization while he was in high school. He rises through the ranks. The, his colleagues in the Nazi group respect him, and then his true identity is discovered the result is that he's brutally beaten, he's left for dead, they try to drown him in the Atlantic Ocean, and God had other plans for his future. Uh, he miraculously survives the attack, even though they think he's dead. He returns and then gives evidence against the organization's leaders to help bring them down. And now his story is being developed into a graphic novel, and he's also the star of a movie that you can check out called Escape from Room 18. So John, thanks so much for joining us. You've got, like I keep saying over and over again, just such a fascinating story. Um, so to start from the beginning, can you kind of explain to us your childhood and whether there was any link between circumstances you faced as a child and how that resulted in you joining a Nazi group? To get into, involved with the Nazi group, that was something that happened a little bit later in my life when I was a teenager. When I was, as a child, we were more involved. My parents were definitely involved in our lives. It was, it was a nice home up, up, upbringing, if you will. Um, unfortunately though, I was in a gifted classes in high school. So that kind of put me on the outs with some of the cooler kids, if you will. <laughs> right. And uh, when you're on the outs with the cooler kids, you look for something to do. And uh, one of the other nerdy kids, uh, took me to his birthday party, and at his birthday party, there were some skinheads, and that's how my first contact. Before how, that, how old, if I may ask, how old were you when that happened? About what age? I was 15 years old when that happened. Wow. 15. So up to that point, I had a relatively normative life. Uh, I was bar mitzvah. Um, Jewishness was something that was alive in our home. We didn't live in a thriving Jewish community. Ocala, Florida didn't have one at the time. Um, my dad, uh, moved with different jobs and because of the different jobs that they would place him or with my own, uh, education schools changing, uh, and this is something I warned Ryan about at the very beginning. Uh, I have a brain tumor. I've had two brain tumor, two brain tumor operations. I take a lot of medications for epilepsy. So from time to time I get stuck or paused or something like that. I've given Ryan free reign to be like, all right, this is what you were saying. So we can kind of get back to track. Uh, it's a Thank lot easier with a live audience. So if he and I do that back and forth, he has free reign. Uh, so growing up through my childhood was relatively normal in a lot of respects. 
I guess. Wow. So, so it was really just your social circle as a teenager, uh, having Nazis enter into it, not something you planned. So when that happens, did you tell your family members like, hey, there were skinheads at the party or my new friend is a skinhead or did you keep it quiet right from the beginning? Typically, we tend to think that all skinheads are racist. The ones that I first met were not. Yeah, I saw the look in your eye like, what? Uh, the first yeah. guys that I met, uh, it was a birthday party for a buddy of mine. He took me along and there were some guys there. And while I was chatting with one of them, one of them uh, identified himself as a skinhead. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm sure everything's all well and good, but I'm Jewish. I can't be involved with that. At which point he lifted up his shirt and he had a black and white hand cracking a swastika into it. And he said, no, 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 we're not like those. We're anti-racist. I was like, wow, I didn't know you guys existed. <laughs> anti-racist Nazis, right. Uh, it was this, ironically enough, this was one of the guys that led the Nazis to my front door months later. But no, he was, they were all definitely anti-racist. They all knew that I was Jewish. They were, not a one of them was a Nazi. About six months later, it was when we were forcibly recruited when two of the guys went to another city. And when they went to that city, they were approached by some Nazis that said, okay, give us the names and addresses of your friends. And that's how uh, the Nazis got to me. So he tells you we're not racist. Did you challenge that idea or ask him to explain it? Because I would imagine that first conversation would be a little bit difficult. Well, we also have to keep in mind, this is pre-internet days when we were inundated with stuff. This was pre, uh, you know, pre-Trump when we were inundated with everything that isn't like this is racist. So it wasn't a, a, as much of a charged period. I knew that racists exist. I knew neo-Nazi skins existed. But I didn't know that anti-racist skins existed. It didn't take much for me to sit there and talk with them to kind of get an understanding that they were definitely not racist by any stretch of the imagination. They sat there and made fun of uh, the racist skins now define them as their enemies. And as I came to find out later, that definitely was the case. There are organizations called Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice, which are skinheads that fight racist skinheads. So this is news to me. <laughs> So what was their ideology? If you're a skinhead who's against racism, or at least you think you're against racism, what, like, what's your cause? Like, what's the identity of a skinhead at that point? Traditional working class skinheads are Britain's most successful, successful export. There are skinheads all over the world. There have been skinheads found in Israel, as a matter of fact, racist skinheads, as a matter of fact. Um, so what makes you a skinhead is the fact that it was the opposite of whatever the hippies wanted in the 1960s. You have long hair, we'll have no hair. You're for peace, love, and harmony, we're for fighting. We want to fight. Um, we're the proud blue-collar middle class is really how they started out. And getting involved with, um, it, based off of reggae music, ironically enough. So initially you could not be a racist skinhead. To be a skinhead by definition was to be anti-racist. It was only over time that it was able to pull them in and start radicalizing them. And then from there, it's all history. Wow, I'm willing to bet that almost everybody watching right now is, this is news to them and they're a little puzzled by it. But it, it reminds me a little bit of people who join Antifa because they say they're anti-fascist, but then they act like fascists. So they say, okay, well, we need to go beat up the fascists and take away their ability to assemble and have free speech and everything, which is the definition of fascism. Uh, it, it seems like that's a similar dynamic. Would you say that's kind of a, a fair comparison or am I misunderstanding? There are some definite similarities to it. They are definitely about fighting. It's all pro-violence. Um, at any opportunity that they can, they will. And it's never one-on-one. -on -one. It's as many skinheads as are in the region against whoever they're fighting, uh, which is what makes them incredibly dangerous. As for the different types of groups, my parents were totally convinced I was in a Nazi group until they started meeting some of my friends and realized that they weren't. When I first met them, they said, no, we call ourselves MCAR, Marion County Against Racism. That was just the name of their little club. Marion County was the county that I lived in. And as for parents that think that, hey, my kid is a racist, I spoke in a, skin, in a, 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 a synagogue one time and said, Shul, I'm trying to avoid anything that 
anyone else who doesn't understand Hebrew or Jewish sayings will <laughs> get lost. Right. Um, and this mother spoke to me the following morning. She drove me to the airport. And uh, so I just want to thank you. I had a son, have a son that was involved in the skinheads and he'd come home with red knuckles. And the Jewish mother would shout at her son because he was a Nazi. So now I was beating up Nazis. And she said, it wasn't until she heard me speak some four years after they had these battles that she understood that, uh, wow, there really were anti-racist skinheads. Wow. So explain to us the, how you then go from these anti-racist skinheads to joining a neo-Nazi group. Is it that the skinheads that were anti-racist became Nazis or did you switch from being involved in the skinhead group joining another group that was Nazis? Two of my friends went to Orlando, Florida. When they were in Orlando, Florida, they went to a club. In this club, they were approached by a group of neo-Nazi skins. And those guys, when they approached them, said, we want the name, amongst every other things, we want the names and addresses of your friends. So one day there was a knock on my front door. I opened the front door and there were three Nazi skinheads standing outside, which was pretty obvious based by their tattoos and the patches they had on their jackets and such, at which point I was faced with a very immediate choice that I could either bring them into my home where they would see items that related to Judaism and they wouldn't know who to attack first, myself or the other five family members that were in the home at the time, um, or all of us. So I had to make a choice. I could leave with them and I could take the one that was gonna get the beating, which is what I figured was why they were there in the first place, or I could share that beating with my family. So I chose to leave with them. When I left with them, each one told me a story of someone who used to be involved, left, and then was mysteriously shot or mysteriously caught on fire. And there are three guys, and each one's telling me a story. And then the driver leans over the back seat and says, welcome aboard. What do you say? I'm Jewish. Sorry, guys. I didn't wear this back then. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> So, so they didn't know you were Jewish. The Nazis showed up and they, they just thought you were a member of the anti-racist skinhead. Of a skinhead group, correct. That was enough for them. He's a skinhead, we're going to recruit him. Forcibly recruiting others wasn't uncommon. There, there was an anti-racist group that did it in South Florida at the same time. Uh, there was a group called the Social Outcasts that were a very hardcore white power racist group in South Florida. <clears throat> And as the story went at the time, there was a group of anti-racists that were assassinating them. And then they gave them a choice. Listen, you can either join us, or we're gonna kill you. So there were Nazis walking around, well, former Nazis walking around Miami, Florida that had swastika tattoos that were in anti-racist gangs, but they were only in it because they feared for their life. Hmm. And I was the reverse. So it's not uncommon. Well, at least it wasn't 30 years ago. This isn't a brand new story. Wow, wow. So now you've got me on the edge of my seat, um, even though I know a, a bit about your story, but there are key elements that um, I guess I wasn't aware of. So you're forced into this Nazi group. So they obviously don't trust you at this point. Um, how do you build trust at, at that point to where you actually rise up in the organization? I would imagine someone with your history and being one of their rivals they, they would never trust you. They wouldn't want you to rise up in the ranks, but somehow you, you achieved that. So how did that happen? You learn how to pare it back to the things that they want to have said. Um, I always figured that anytime they talked about something anti-Semitic or anything against Judaism, that it was because they were trying to seek it a rise out of me. So I would just turn the conversation in other direction and say, yeah, but what about those immigrants? Aren't the immigrants the real problem? And then just, whoop, they'd switch. And they left everything regarding Jews behind. It wasn't difficult to change where the direction they were going in. The fact that I was the only one that was still in school, one of the few that actually had a job, um, the one, one of the few that didn't get tattoos, the long sleeves is because it's winter. That's all. Okay. Uh, not to hide anything. Um, and because I wasn't trying to be like everybody else, but I tried to be a little bit different. And I would say, I'm not a racist, I'm prejudiced. I selectively dislike people. Um, for some of the leadership, they said, this is a guy that can think on his feet. And that's slowly but surely how I started going up, which is wow, that, Yeah, I wasn't scary. expecting an answer like that. I would have 
expect you to say you doubled down on the extremism uh, to try to tell them everything that they wanted to hear, but instead you had your own little unique take that they found value in and found respect for. And so you rise up within the organization um, and did you have to go to any extraordinary measures to hide your Jewish background at that point? Or was there, did you not come from a, a practicing household so it was kind of easy to hide? Once I got involved with the skinheads and I started seeing what type of group they actually were, I started cutting ties with a lot of my friends and I started distancing myself from my family because this was something that once you were involved, it wasn't, would you like to hang out with us? It's, oh, you're one of us now. And once that happens, you don't really have a lot of places to go to. And they were quite proud of the fact that of the people that tried to leave and the violence that they would inflict upon them, skinheads are very quick to dish out violence on themselves, on each other. So uh, it wasn't so much that I was hiding something from my, uh, hiding anything from my family. My family knew what I was involved in. I was just cutting the, the barriers between us so that it would be, in my mind, it'd be easier for them when I died when I, when I got murdered, that it would be easier that I'd be the stranger. That's the wisdom of, of a 16 year old kid, mind you. It, it makes sense though. Like I, I, can, I can see the logic to that. Um, if you're involved in something like that and you, you don't know how to get out and you feel that you're going to there end is up no dead, I, I could see why you would start severing those relationships for their protection and also sort of as a emotional defense for them and yourself. Um, so that the pain is less as those, as those bonds break and, and you end up, at, as you thought, you're going to end up dead. Um, so I actually, under, I, I can see someone even beyond the age of a teenager doing something like that. So you, you get involved in the neo-Nazi group mm -hmm. beyond, you know, what people know where they hate Jews and, and they like Hitler and all of that. Were there any broader themes that resonated that allowed them to recruit? Was there some political topic that wasn't blatant Nazism that they would use in order to start conversations with people and, and reel them in? I've been asked many times what it takes to recruit somebody. And my response is usually just, let's go to a pool hall, pub, or anything of that nature. Let me walk in, look for the person that's by themselves. Let's approach them and be nice to them. It's that simple. Show somebody attention, positive attention, and you start and you have it in. And once you have that in, you just keep slowly but surely funneling it in. Like, all right, let me tell you. And what they try and do, one of the ways, the best way to recruit, or not necessarily to recruit, to radicalize somebody. Um, I know this was a, a point you wanted to touch on. Do you want me to touch on it now or wait till we, we build up go, to it? Go for it, sure. One of the radical if one of the main things that the skinheads do is they convince you that any fault in your life isn't because of you. It's because of some kind of global conspiracy. And no one ever, I mean, from the, if starting off the first story back in the Bible uh, with Adam and Eve, it wasn't me, it was a snake. Or it wasn't me, it was because of him or her, sorry. Um, and they do the exact same. It's, it's, humans, it's human history. We like to blame somebody else. I was late to work, not because I didn't get up on time, but because there was this, that, or the other. We find excuses. The dog ate my homework. They take that and raise it to the next level. You're not making enough money at work. Are you making enough money at work? Anyone besides, I don't think anyone besides Bill Gates might be happy with the amount of money they're making. Uh, and what they do is they say, okay, you're not making enough. Well, it's because of this didn't get good grades at school, it's because of that. Um, your parents got divorced, well, it's because of this. And what they do is they take every single failure in your life and convince you it's not because of you, it's because of this global conspiracy. And at that point, you now have a holy warrior. And when you have a holy warrior, you have someone that's willing to do anything to anybody at any time because they no longer see them as a human. Hmm. They see it as part of the cause. And it does not take a lot of time to do that. And that's a great articulation of, of something that you see across all the extremist ideologies. It's always this like global conspiracy. And that's why uh, conspiracy theories um, and, and people that promote them and make a ton of money off promoting them really are so dangerous. It's not just fun speculation, but it does build this worldview that's only inches away from one of these extremist ideologies. Because as soon as you believe that 
you can't better your own life because of a global conspiracy, that means there's some group running the global conspiracy. Now all you got to do is identify the group and you're ready to go to war against them. So that's um, something that's across all the ideologies. And I can see, uh, you know, how important of a role that would play in the story that you're describing. But what I want to ask you is that you pointed out how the neo-Nazis would look at someone in, who's standing alone in a corner at a, at a pub and they would start talking to them and be nice to them. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this. Their ideas obviously are not nice. Their behavior overall, not nice. Overall, not a nice person. But when they're being nice for the sake of recruiting, is it them being an actor or do they actually have part of them that is genuinely nice? I think that varies. I think just like with all humans, all of us have one aspect that's positive, one aspect that's negative. We can respond different ways to different situations. And I think when you've got someone that's alone and you've got someone that approaches them and says, hey, we want to be with you, we want to support you. There is a power in all, in all of a sudden being a part of a group. And when you're a part of a group, you have an identity, which is something that you did not have before. So it's definitely everybody feeding off of one another. It's a type of group think, I would say that um, mm. if, I, if I see you doing it, Ryan's obviously a good, good guy, then it's got to be okay for me to do it. And that's really one of the ways that they pull people in and do different things. They, you see that somebody is good, but they're doing a bad thing. But if they're good, you try and rationalize. And that cognitive dissonance is very difficult for all of us to fight against. And when you're dealing with kids, it's even harder. So, so with the Nazis, when they're recruiting someone or targeting someone to recruit, mm -hmm. do they actually care about them? I, is it possible for someone with that extremist ideology to, yes, they're trying to recruit them for a cause, but does part of them actually say, I'm going to improve that person's life? Or is it purely about pride and saying, hey, I recruited the guy into our group and that's it? It's pride in numbers, because that's one of the things they used to ask me. How many people did you recruit? How many people did you bring in? And I would just go out, oh, yeah, I brought in X amount, or I've talked to this amount, or I've got a few on the hook. And my friends locally would, would joke around that I was uh, the leader of a group of one, <laughs> because right. I was the leader. None of them wanted to be Nazis, but we had to be when the other guys were around. And when I say other guys were around, do you remember, this is going back a few years, the Geraldo Rivera show, we got his nose broken from the group of skinheads that he invited. Uh, he had skinheads on the stage and he had uh, anti-racists also on the stage and they started a dialogue back, a dialogue, this, a debate back and forth. No, but, but also the volume's a little low. So I'm having some, I'm missing a few details, but um, you, you can go ahead. I got the, I got the idea of the example. You got so. the gist, okay. Um, there was a fight on a Geraldo Rivera show where he had some skinheads. Of the three skinheads, oh, yes. yep. of the three skinheads that were on the stage, one of them I met, he came to Ocala several times to meet with me, not just with me, but that they would come to Ocala and he was driven by actually the guy that uh, drove the people with the, the first guy to try and kill me. So those weren't actors on Geraldo's show? No. Oh, no. Uh, that was the real thing. Wow. Oh, yeah. And when you start meeting people like that, that's, you're hanging out with the devil and you know it. <laughs> what are you going to do? Where do you go? How do you run? And did you ever try to run? Was there any, did you have any opportunities to get out of the group that you felt were worth taking or was it just better not to try? At 16, am I going to tell my parents, Hey, let's move. They're going to say, stop hanging out with them. Don't spend time with them. If you spend time with them, this will all go away. It won't be a problem. Um, with running away, they made sure that we knew that they had law enforcement that they were friends with that they could track us down no matter where we went across the country. And that was something that was heavily, heavily, heavily beat into our heads. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, we can always find you. And you believe it, especially when they start mentioning law enforcement. That's pretty scary. What do you mean by that? Because everyone would assume law enforcement would be those that facilitate you getting out of the group. I met some that were that way, but they did talk about they knew some that were uh, openly racist or supportive of the racist side, that if you ever need anything, if you ever get in trouble, call me and I'll make it go away, which was scary. Yeah. 
did you know if these were just stories meant to scare you or did you actually meet people in law enforcement who were secretly following this type of ideology and willing to help these guys out? The law enforcement officer that I knew specifically in my city, I know that he definitely followed it and definitely believed it. And um, follow up with him, it was just too scared to deal with. After I was jumped by the skins and I went into hiding, one of the things that they told my parents was, don't tell us where he goes. If we have to, we'll, we'll have to put down the address of where he goes. And once we put down that information, it could be law enforcement that actually gives him over to the skinheads to find him and kill him to finish the job. Wow. Yeah, that is a terrifying situation to be in. Um, and, and just so people know, uh, obviously anyone that has seen some of the videos I'll put out, um, I'm as pro police as you can possibly get without, you know, just defending every single thing a cop does. Um, I detest anti-police bigotry, but I do monitor extremist accounts online. And this is still a problem. There, you will see current and former members of the police and the military who are sympathetic to white supremacist ideas if you monitor these accounts. Um, right. it, it is a problem. And if you do just even some Googling, you'll hear about stories of groups of co cops being caught with white supremacist tattoos and things like that. So uh, there's a broader lesson for today in the story that John is, is sharing with us um, in regards to law enforcement. Again, obviously the vast, vast majority are, are some of the best people on earth. Um, the anti-police bigotry is, I, I believe, a major national security threat to all of us. Uh, but white supremacists are recruiting a, some members of the police and the military more than you would think if you monitor these accounts. Um, and, and that's just a reality that we have to be aware of. So John, maybe we're, I don't know if this is skipping a step in your story, but how did the Nazis discover that you were Jewish? I received an order one night, about one o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call and I was told by the deputy director of the group, the group that I was in was called American Front. American Front was a national neo-Nazi organization that they claimed to have 10,000 members from coast to coast. The Eastern States representative, David Lynch, called me one night and he uh, told me that he wanted to tattoo off of this one individual, a girl from my city that had American Front tattooed on the back of her neck. And he called me and said, I don't care what you do to her, but I want that tattoo back. So basically, what was he saying? Kill her. Do you know of anybody that would say, sure, you can take my tattoo? Right. So I went to her and said, listen, I don't know what you did, but you have a problem with these guys and they want me to solve it. And this is what they want me to do. As the ex-wife of a very good friend of mine and also being from my city in the original group, she knew that I'm Jewish. So the easiest way to save herself was to go to some cr a crazier group of skinheads and say, hey, let me tell you something you're going to really want to know. And uh, within a week, I was ordered to attend an officer's meeting in Daytona Beach, Florida. And that's where they had dis uh, discussions of how best to kill me. The first thought was to shoot me, but they had shot another member five, two weeks earlier. Five shots, hit the guy twice and managed to convince law enforcement it was an accident. And so the, the night of, with me, they were sure they wanted to shoot me, but um, in the discussion back and forth, they said, listen, there's a limit to how many accidents we can have within a given period of time before the police realize their purposes. So we have to find another way to kill them. And the way to kill them was they told the beach, we're close to the water, let's drown them. And that was the plan. Okay, so they decide to take you out um, and, and to kill you. So can you tell us a, a little bit about that attack? And I mean, how do you survive that? How, how does that happen? I'm thankful every day that I'm here. Um, we went down to the beach and my first thought was, okay, we're at the beach. At some point I can leave these alcoholics behind because everybody was drunk save myself. At some point, I knew that something was going to happen that night. Just based off the vibe, I started getting off of different individuals. And um, I refused to get drunk, though they really, really wanted me to. And uh, when we went down to the beach, my thought was I'll leave them at the surf and be able to go back home once they're all out in the sea. Who wants to play around in the sea at 2 o'clock in the morning? 
not me, especially in October. Uh, one guy punched me here from the behind. I turned to him, and when I started uh, scrapping with him, somebody shouted out now. And at that now, six other skinheads jumped on top of me. So I had seven guys punching me, trying to get me down to the ground. The reason why skinheads wear combat boots is for what they call a boot party, to kick somebody. And that was something I kept trying to fight my way back up because I knew what they wanted to do if I was on the ground. Once they managed to get me on the ground and keep me on the ground, the boots just kept flying. And uh, they were mostly from here to there. So they focused on my head and shoulders, up and above, whatever they could hit, but primarily tried to kick my head as much as possible. And uh, <laughs> I guess the brain tumor might be the result of that, who knows? Now, have you, since that attack, have you <laughs> met any of these guys? Um, I mean, I would hope, kind of hope so that you could at least sue them if you couldn't imprison them. Well, they went to jail. They went they to, jail. to jail. Okay. Yeah. So I, all the guys that attacked you did go to jail? For the most part. Person by person. Uh, there was one guy, it's during the course of the beating, I didn't know what was going on. I thought maybe it was a promotion. I mean, who knows? Because they do jump people in. I thought maybe they were pushing me up a level. Who knows? Uh, to uh, promote someone, they beat them up? Well, when you have a new member, sometimes they beat them up. One of the things they like to do is have people fill out uh, applications, like a membership form. I looked over to my side because I have one over here. An original, I have original stuff from the 30 years ago that skinheads used to use. Now everything's online, but every paper forms and stuff like that. All right, if you got sensitive device, I'm gonna look away, but just, you know, stuff like that. Just where they take stuff that they pass out. Um, your regular bad guys in their opinion, but um, this is what they did. They just gave me a boot party to the best of their ability. One guy grabbed me and started dragging me out to sea. And as he was taking me out to sea, my first thought was, this is awesome because it's gonna slow down their kicks. Ah. I mean, my first thought was, this is the best thing they could do is get me into the water because they can't kick me as hard. Now, mind you, this is out me going in and out of unconscious, being kicked in and out of unconsciousness for a good long period of time. Um, when I looked up and I looked into his eyes, I understood what was about to happen, that they were going to kill me. And at that point, fear took over. And I just shouted out, don't do this thing. Don't do this thing. No one came to my aid. No one was coming. And when someone shouted out, die, you boy, die, that was it. There's no point being afraid anymore. I knew what was up. This is it. It's over. So one dragged me out, held me under, thought that he drowned me. The group left, turned around and saw that I was still alive. I was sitting up uh, on the edge of the surf. One came back and tried to convince me that nothing happened because I was asking, what you guys do? Why did this take place? And then one enraged came running and kicked me here so hard it lifted me straight up off my, from sitting to standing. And then all of them jumped along me again. But this time two took me up, one side of my back and one choked me as they pushed my face down into the sand of the water. It takes two pulls of your diaphragm to fill your lungs with salt water. And when the tide comes in, you can feel your lungs expand. When the tide goes out, you can feel your lungs deflate, which is really, really bizarre. So your first thought is I'm dead, but I'm breathing. You know, how is this possible? Their testimony in court was I was a foot underwater, my eyes and mouth were open and they pushed me and watched me float out to sea. And I woke up above the shoreline. There's no explanation as to how that happened. No human wow. explanation. Wow, so, so you survived for reasons basically unknown. You, you just woke up and you were where, back on the beach? You woke up and you're like- I was above the shoreline, correct. And there's, the tide was actually going out. So law enforcement said, there's no way all this happened the way you said it happened. Because if it did, this couldn't have happened. This couldn't, you shouldn't be here for this. And they went through a list of reasons as to why I should not have survived. I found my car and drove the 80 plus miles back to where I lived uh, that same night. That's, that's amazing. So it's the Tell us what it's like. So you realize, hey, you're alive and you survived this thing. It makes no sense. And obviously you're grateful to be alive. So yeah, we all know that. But what do you feel 
emotion emotionally like what like do you say immediately god must have a bigger mission for me or do you feel like empowered like i got through that so now i'm going to take the risk to bring these guys down or like how does that affect your mindset when i was in the hospital over the court i was hospitalized for a week for aspirated pneumonia which was due to inhaling the salt water while i was uh, in the hospital during the course of that week i consulted with one of my skinhead friends and said listen man they did this because i'm jewish we know this and i think that's something that uh, i should face or, or speak about uh there was the hate crimes law in the state of florida and i felt this was something that should be pursued I was still telling my family and those around me, this was just a wild, a random attack. I didn't mention skinheads at all. It was the skinheads started turning themselves in because they realized that, hey, this guy's still alive and we're gonna go to prison. So they tried to get ahead of the game, if you will. So they started turning themselves in and ratting each other out. So this group of brothers was turning on one another as fast as they could. So while I was in the hospital, I realized that I had to speak up, I had to fight. And I wasn't, and I knew that ultimately I wanted to go to Israel. This is where I wanted to be for eons. Well, not really eons, but for as long as I know myself. But during that period, I also knew that if you beat up a Jew and he goes to Israel, but you beat up a black person, you go to prison, you beat up a Spanish person, you go to prison, you beat up an Asian, you go to prison, but the Jew goes to Israel, what do you just, what message did I just send? Beat mm. up Jews. So kind of sort of have to stick around and fight, which is exactly what I did. Court cases for every single one of them. Well, not every single one of them. Two pleaded out for attempted murder. Um, one pleaded for, I guess, assault and battery. One of the attackers gave total and complete, turned on everybody and said, in the place of, look, thank you for what you're doing. Leave the state when this is over and don't come back because this felony is still dangling over your head, the potential felony. Two other guys were from my city. They got there that night in my car and they apparently were forced to participate. They said they didn't. The other five guys said they did. Um, so ultimately, that with the help of the Anti-Defamation League, a lawsuit was brought against them for a small amount of damages, just so there would be something on the record that these guys were involved. And uh, as for meeting him, yeah, I saw him at the court cases. But other than that, we didn't socialize afterwards. Right, yeah. yeah. Do, do you know. happen to know if um, these guys are still Nazis or were you able to at least debunk their ideology enough that they ditched that? The two that went to, mur to prison for attempted murder are definitely still happily involved at least from the, what I see off of their public social media profiles. The, the, are they in prison now? Oh, they're out. That's when okay, I moved so to Israel. They're out and, and they're still posting Nazi stuff on social media. Well, what you can see, like uh, when you put a frame around your picture on Facebook and it's for something, sometimes you can tend to see that. And plus one of the guys, 2007, so several years ago, there was an article uh, called 10 Who Terrify. And one of my guys is one of the top 10 scariest neo-Nazis in the United States. Woohoo! Wow. Yeah. So I've got to ask this. Did you send these guys a friend request when you saw their profile? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there was one once that the way this profile looked, he looked kind of sad. And I thought about writing to him like, you know, man, I'm sorry. We all make mistakes in our life? Did your life come out? How did things work out? But something inside of me said, no. Mm. And so I just wait, I hung, hung tight, but every so often I'd go back and check. And when I saw something about, I saw uh, some runes, just different stuff that symbolized various white supremacist organizations that were on his picture. Like, okay, hmm. be well, but be out of my life. Thank you. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. After all that, that they would still buy into that um it, it's in a way radical islam makes more sense doctrinally you know you can see why someone wouldn't leave that um some of these other ideologies because there's more of a twisted logic where some of some of these like nazi groups um you just look into ba the basic science and the weight of their arguments and it's so easy to debunk 
that I guess what you say makes sense. That's more about your social circle than it is about some deep intellectual quest, um, which kind of brings me to uh, another question for you. Obviously, you watch the news, so you, you've seen about how anti-Semitism is rising still. Um, the white nationalist movement is increasing still. People debate how much of a threat it is and compared to radical Islam. I say it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is our staff monitors these accounts. We monitor the groups. They're growing. John, what do you think is causing them to grow? Um, because it's known if you Google you know, the history of these groups, a lot of them do get locked up. A lot of them do have their lives ruined. It would appear to someone on the outside, like myself, that there's no incentive really to join this group. And if you join them to stick with them, but they're growing. So what factors do you think are behind that? There is, uh, there are a lot of various competitive narratives about uh, how when a white, a mass shooter that's a white supremacist is arrested, he tends to get arrested alive. Well, he wants that because in prison, he's a God. I mean, now the organizations, they refer to them as saints. Whenever you see a white supremacist commit a mass shooting, he is then coined as a saint within the white supremacist organizations. And while he's in jail, he's getting fan mail, he's getting letters, people are reaching out to him, thanking him for what he did. Uh, and their addresses, like how to reach these guys are passed within the various forms, which is something I'm sure a lot of your uh, investigators can authenticate. It's something that they add, hey, this, you should reach out to these guys. And um, there's an incentive when you become, when you're nobody and all of a sudden you're pushed into fame, you have movies made about you, no shortage of documentaries, people are constantly talking about who you are, how you got to where you are, what made you what you are, and that brings fame to a nobody. And I think now, especially with COVID, we're all locked at home, everybody's a little upset at something, and we've got time, we're all online. I mean, that's one big question, how do people get radicalized? Radicalized. Well, look at this, I'm sitting here in Israel, I have no idea where you're at, but there are people all over the world that could potentially be watching and will eventually see this. So that answers the questions of how we can rattle, how we can reach people and radicalize them online. If you're sitting someplace and somebody is your personal soothsayer, which with fake news, we can always find somebody that's going to tell us what we want to hear the way we want to hear it. Yeah. Doesn't and matter. You what, can now find evidence for anything because the precisely. standard of evidence is so low that you can always point to some discrepancy in a story to vindicate what your point of view is. So when people say, oh, there's no evidence, you're actually always able to come up with some stretch of evidence. And there's enough of that weak evidence that by the sheer number of it, it appears to be a persuasive case. But precisely. a large number of pieces of weak evidence isn't actually a strong case. But to Correct. a lot of people, it seems like it. So uh, I'm sorry to jump in like that, but you, you continue your point. Feel free. Uh, I mean, jumping in is, is exactly what I told you to do. It's something where I was because of that. <laughs> um, no, with the guys being involved with uh, radicalism and grabbing people offline, it's not difficult at all. Uh, and I watch it more and more. I definitely keep an eye on the groups. As people ask, well, what, what's happening now? I have to make sure that I stay current on what they're saying now versus what they were saying years ago. The reason why I had these old um, flyers out was I look at what they use now, how they put memes out and they take a meme and they turn the meme from something that, say, a teenager might recognize from a, a film, and then they'll change a little, as a little aspect of it to make it a little bit racist. And then the hmm. kid will go, oh, okay. And now it's, you're talking a language they understand. That was something the Christchurch shooter put into his manifesto, which is something that I read. I read the manifestos whenever these crazies do something uh, just to see, OK, what was happening? What were they trying to say? What's in their mindset? And that's one thing that he puts out there is meme. One of the most powerful tools you have is the meme, because you can take a little picture, make a little story. And then from that, people will share it and pass it around. I've seen stuff online that is shared from one side to the other to another. It just travels all the way across the internet and people don't even notice that on it, there are white supremacist symbols. Wow, that, you know, I've kind of noticed that too, where I've seen people who are not white supremacists, but they have some racist tinges to their belief because 
they're consuming so much news and they're interpreting it in a certain way and blaming a certain people group for things happening. Uh, and then they start digesting these kind of racist and, and dark humor memes. And it's entertaining to them because there's a sense of humor involved, might be pop cultural references. So it's not just reading a dry, updated copies of Mein Kampf over and over again. There's an entertainment value. Um, and, and a meme is something you pass along to your friends. So it accelerates those bonds. And then as you become uh, immune to those types of dark humor memes, then you start getting to the more racist ones and the more racist ones because right. you're not offended by it. And it, it just escalates until really there is like a meme obsession we're seeing among a lot of these people. And it, it's so critical to the radicalization process. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, because that is possibly the strongest trend that we're seeing. It's not, it's not like these manuals. It's, it's, it's really just memes and Facebook posts and things like that. Um, so that, that kind of explains a bit how technology is changing how they recruit and they spread. Would you say technology uh, is the main reason that they're growing though? Because it's one thing that they change and it's still status quo, but why are they growing? Is that just because of the internet or is there, is there some new strategy that they're following or is there something going on politically that they're able to tap into? I think definitely now with COVID, everyone's afraid. And that fear is something that they like to play off of. The reason for your fear is because it, it, I've seen so much about how we Jews were behind, <laughs> we're behind COVID. And now right. we're behind, you know, the solution, apparently, where we're going to be implanting or chipping people all over the planet. It's the conspiracy theories are, are radical and insane and somewhat humorous to an extent. When you look at it logically, and you say, how can somebody believe that? Well, the thing is, they do. They believe it because it's really simple. It answers all their problems without them having, without them having to think. And not having to think is something that uh, a lot of us like. We like to have things handed to us very easily. When we go online, what do we see? We see little snippets, little blurbs. We are now the Twitter society where you take acronyms and an acronym is a word. We're now living abroad. I look at Americans, what American press, and I have to figure out what does FLOTUS mean, POTUS, SCOTUS, all these short little terms that I never ever paid attention to or never thought of that it's at Twitter speak. And I had to learn it as it would go by. So with these guys, for them just being able to tap into uh, the anger that is within the internet now and just be a part of it and play up on it. And some of them, they just enjoy making, uh, running things amok, just causing uh, trouble, which again, to refer back to, and I don't mean to keep referring back to uh, the Christchurch Manifesto. The reason why I'm going back to it is simply, it happened in 2019. Over 50 souls perished because of this man's radical hatred. This was an Australian that committed an act in New Zealand. And part of his manifesto was he hoped to impact American elections. And that's something that I think tends to be missed. That something can happen to one side of the earth um, by one of them, hoping that it's going to help others on the other side. Mm -hmm. Others within the group, if you will. So political, yes, of course, there was some radical, there was radicalization with Trump. However, it was also with the Department of Homeland Security, April of 2009, one of their biggest threats they put forward was the lone wolf white supremacist. Yeah. And that's open source. That's declassified. That's very, very simple to get to and read. So white supremacists just didn't pop up. And what we see in the news, I mean, God bless, with my case, I was, as I was looking for some other articles, rummaging through, I came across a newspaper article that said the title was the rise in anti-Semitic, the rise in racism or hate groups. This was 30 years ago. This is not a new trend. This has been around. It just depends on what's taking over the narrative of the news media for that day or that week or that hour. Depends on what you see. Right. That, you raise so many good points I'd like to dive into. We don't have enough time to, but the idea that conspiracy theories seem so complex because they, it's about a complex supposed conspiracy globally, uh, but it's actually a simplistic answer. And there's a lot of comfort in that. And you also get to sound like a, a know-it-all when you speak like, ah, I, I know the inner workings. I'm, 
intellectually superior to whoever I'm talking to because I know what's really going on. And I think that's attractive to people. And I know I've tried to engage some people that believe in that stuff. Um, and it's pretty much impossible to debunk it because it, it's not one argument. It, they have so much horrible circumstantial evidence that would never rise up to a level of, of court evidence, but there's so much of it that you're, you debunk something. They say, well, what about this? You debunk it. What about this? And it just keeps going. Um, so how can someone, if you know someone who's been radicalized or you're worried about your child potentially becoming radicalized because you know there's kids at school who are cool or not cool, but in a social circle uh, that have these beliefs and you want to prevent them from getting there, what would your recommendations be in, in those two circumstances? How do we prevent people from becoming radicalized? And then once they're radicalized, how can we pull them out of it? Prevention is, can be difficult because you don't always know what's going on inside somebody's mind. If somebody feels like they're off on the fringe, you may not always see that. Can you get them involved in something? Can you get them involved in some kind of positive project so it's raising their self-worth, be it from uh, the martial arts or some other, doing some kind of positive activity, if you will. Um, getting somebody out is usually the power of one. Somebody that shows them that they're wrong. And by being wrong, I mean by being nice. You don't expect people to be nice to you. And that's something that across the board, everyone that I've watched in any documentary or listened to in any webinar or watched online as they discussed how they got out of uh, a racist or any other uh, extremist organization typically came back to somebody proving that they were wrong simply by being that person, by being nice. It, it, it's amazing because that really does, if you're a member of a hate group, yeah, you can argue with them about all the supposed intellectual reasons that they hate a certain group. You're kind of wasting your time because you can debunk it just by not being that caricature, you know, because they're saying that you're evil, you're inherently bad. By not being bad, then it hits all those arguments at once and express, meeting their hate with love and caring is something that they're not going to be able to find a meme to defeat that. They're not going to be able to find some pseudo intellectual argument to defeat that. Um, so it, it's a very powerful weapon. And I was doing a webinar with someone else who was a member of a Nazi group. And I asked him what he would say to someone who had joined a Nazi group and was radicalized. And his answer was, I wouldn't say anything. I would listen. And I was excellent. like, excellent. What a great answer, because I'm always thinking of the ideological war, the political war, how to beat back propaganda. So, sometimes just listening and letting them vent and, and explain why they feel the way they do, in a way allows them to, that experience can help undermine their own arguments. So that I think is, was amazing advice. Is there like a quick anecdote or anything that you can share with us of where this actually works? Because there's going to be some people that say, I'm sure people have been nice to them. That's, that's not going to work. It sounds like, you know, like a wussy answer, right? Um, is there a quick anecdote of someone you know who was in like a Nazi extremist group or something like that and in just a simple interaction started to change? I recommend anybody watch the movie Skin, which is about a hardcore white supremacist skinhead that because of the interaction of a black man with him, I said, how can you hate me? You don't even know me. And this gentleman has led over 200 white supremacists out of their organizations. The film Skin tells a story of one. And it's very well done. And in the film, there are discussions of, well, maybe about violence towards them. Wow. That, all right. So that's a, a great recommendation. Uh, before we run, John, is there anything that you're currently working on that you'd like our audience to know about? Is there anything that you could get some help with or, or anything else? Because we, we do these webinars not just to hear a fascinating story. We, we all want to make a difference. Um, for myself, one of the things that I'm involved in is one, I have a website, You Begin Change. A friend of mine built it this summer thinking, hey, this is a, <laughs> people need to know you're out there. And I'm kind of happy actually not. One of the coolest things I ever got from uh, our phone call was I had a, 
have produced from National Geographic reach out to me and say, you're a very difficult man to find. <laughs> I said, thank you. You know, coming from National Geographic, I like that. That makes me feel a lot safer. I don't like people knowing where I am or how to get to me. Um, so that's one website that I, is kind of coming together that I can be involved with people. I have someone working on uh, a graphic novel. And the graphic novel, the idea with that is to start working with kids. The documentary Escape Room 18 is a fantastic project. Um, and usually when I speak in high schools, I'll start off with talking about either the graphic novel or showing them the trailer to the uh, documentary. And as I discuss with them, I'll say, okay, listen, this happened to me when I was your age and it affected the rest of my life. And that tends to grab the kids instantaneously because they realize this old man is telling them something that the reason why, and there are high school kids actually watching tonight in Israel. Wow. So what various projects, there's always something. God yeah, bless. I mean, right there, especially in the age of COVID, common sense ideas like this uh, encourage me, but they also frustrate me because to me, it seems like common sense to have you do a webinar with a bunch of high schools and middle schools telling your story as like a school event. Uh, and with modern technology, you could do it for like a hundred schools or more at once. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that things like that don't happen? That just makes so much sense. So I hope that people out there uh, who have contacts with school administrators and, and things like that reach out to you because a few things could be more powerful than that. Have John tell a story to kids so that we can inoculate them against extremism for the future. Uh, that, I think that's a fantastic idea. So John, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I wanna thank all of our uh, sponsors who, who made this webinar possible. Uh, that includes Combat Anti-Semitism, the LA Israel Consulate General, Muslims Facing Tomorrow, Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, the Canadian Security Research Group, ZOA Michigan, and Stand With Us Midwest. Again, I'm Ryan Morrow from the Clarion Project. Follow us on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, I think Instagram, Parler, yes. all of those things. Uh, sign up for our email newsletter, especially uh, in case our posts don't show up for you on your social media page, which is an increasing problem. So sign up for our email uh, list so that we can notify you about future webinars. And again, John Daly, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And until next time, I'm Ryan Morrow from the Clarion Project. And I look forward to speaking with you all again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.